But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I want you to look with me uh, in verse number 1. Well, the Bible said, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again I will not spare. Now that's what the preacher said before he got there. He said, I'm going to let you have it. I ain't going to back up when I get there if you ain't got these things fixed. Is basically what he was telling him. He said, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you it is not weak but is mighty in you, for though he was crucified through the weakness, uh, through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves with you in the faith, prove your own selves, know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Father, I pray you'd help us today to help your people. We love you and thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to preach today out of verse number 5, just simply on that statement where he said, Examine yourself. Amen. And I think that self-examination is a good thing. There's, uh, I've been in the prison ministry so long that there's guys I remember when they came in as young men, and now they're going home as older men. I uh, had a nephew that went in when he was 18. He just got out uh, last year, maybe four months ago. He'd been in prison 31 years. Wow. You don't want to grow up in prison. That's a bad place to grow up. He'd been in prison 30 and a half years before he got saved. He came to church with me uh, three times in 30 years, so once a decade's all he could take. And uh, But he's doing well, and that's a blessing. Uh, there's other guys in prison that I remember when they first come down to uh, the steps or they walk through uh, uh, the gate, and they were young men scared to death, and, and they thought, this is never going to end, but time has went on for them, and they're, they're home, and some of them are doing very well, and some of them come back. I've seen them be in for 26 years, be out 27 days, and come right back. That's not a good thing either. But uh, what made the difference in the ones that stayed home and the ones that came back was uh, they got a hold of something. I take very serious what I do. I tell people when I go into prison, I said, I'm reminded when people say, why would you go there? I remind them that somebody's little boy. And, uh, you know, it could be your child. And I said, that's some little boy's father. That some woman's husband, and in time, and when they get out, they could be your neighbor. So uh, if they get saved, uh, it's going to just touch so many other people, and what a blessing that is. And uh, like I said, I've seen some of them uh, play around with it. You know, they'll come down, and there's phonies in prison church. There's phonies in real church on the outside of the fence. And, and uh, I tell people, look, it's not my job to separate them. That's God's job. Uh, he'll separate the tares and the wheat. He knows who the real brethren and the false brethren are. And he's going to deal with them. He's dealing here with this church at Corinth. And if you know anything about this church, uh, it did have some gifted people who had spiritual gifts. But it also had some uh, issues that Paul had to deal with. He said, I'm coming to you the third time. Uh, three times he had dealt with this thing, and he said, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He, he done his church discipline uh, based on what the Bible said. And over in Deuteronomy chapter 19, uh, he goes back and he references uh, verse number 15 when uh, he said this in, uh, in Deuteronomy 9.15. Uh, let me see, I'll find it here in a minute. I think it's 19, or 1915, rather. He, he made this statement to him, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses,
is, shall the matter be established. Or in other words, if you're going to make an accusation against a man, it can't just be me saying something about Doug Foster and uh, you believe in every word I say. I've got to have something to back that up. And he said, I've got to have one or more witnesses. So he was going to discipline this church and deal with these things in the church uh, by, by the Bible. And that's the way to do it. And uh, one thing that uh, Paul's witness was against them was that there were some people living in sin in the church. And uh, he, he dealt with them. In verse number 2, he said, I write to them which heretofore have sinned. He was talking about that sin in the church. We've got to deal with it in a biblical sense. You know, the Bible says not to receive an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses. If we're going to church somebody, we've got to have some proof of this thing. And, uh, you know, I've seen that done. We don't do that much anymore. And anybody that's been around the church house would know that uh, there's sin in our churches. We're, we're not sinless creatures. Saved people can sin, but you deal with that thing and, uh, and you get it right and you move on. But some people refuse to get right. You deal with them and you remove them from the body according to the scriptures. And so he said, I'm, uh, I've got an issue with people living in sin. And uh, there was some that was also uh, questioning his, uh, his apostleship, uh, his leadership. Verse number 3 said, If you seek a proof of Christ... Uh, speaking in me, there were some of the people that, just like Janus and Jambreus, things don't change. They came to Moses and said, look, you take too much on yourself. And look, D uh, Doug Foster is not the Lord of this church, but he is the leader. I think he's done pretty good myself. Amen. He took a handful and God's blessed him with a house full of very good people that's uh, helped him build this church. Him and Annette's uh, sacrificed a lot. He's uh, worked a lot of hours, uh, was tired many times. And look, their kids, just like any preacher's kids, has had to do without their dad, put uh, God first to have what you're enjoying today. But Paul said, I'm going to deal with those people. But Paul had a warning to these people in verse 5. Three times he told them to look at their sales. It's amazing how much we know how everybody else needs to do. If I only knew as much as everybody uh, knew about me, and if I only done what everybody else thought I could do, I would be a rich, sinless, perfection, success. Amen? But he told them here, he said in verse 5, examine yourself. There's nothing like self-examination. When you look in the mirror, you know yourself better than anybody in this building. There's things you know about yourself that only you and God know, and you don't want to be put on a movie screen. But he said you look at yourself, and then he tells them to prove yourself. You look in that perfect law of liberty and you let God's word identify marks in your life, things you need to fix. That's between you and God. And you be honest with him. He said, but you prove your own selves. We live in a time where I don't have to prove nothing to nobody. Oh, yes, you do. Romans 12, 2 said, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. That, uh, he said that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you've got three wills of God there, the good, the perfect, and the acceptable will of God. He said, You prove it to the world, let them see it. And he said, Know your own self. There's some things you ought to settle in your heart. Every time an evangelist comes through some t uh, churches and towns, they'll have, uh, look, they'll, uh, they'll have, there's some preachers I know, they can come preach a revival, and every church after that revival, uh, he said, man, half my church got saved. I'm thinking, what is that guy preaching to them people? Are they listening to anything he said? If I pastored a church and my, half my church got saved every year, I believe I'd go back to Sunday school and learn a little something myself. Amen? But look here, I don't, I don't let people worry me about certain things. I've settled it in this book, and I know it to be the truth. Amen. But he tells them Paul's got a wish for them. And this is my wish for people. In verse 11 he said, Finally, brethren, farewell. 
It ought to do you good when you see other people do good. If you like to see people do bad, and it joys your heart when something's going wrong for them, there's something wrong in your heart. He said, you I want you to fare well. I want you to be full of cheer. I like to see people smiling. I like to hear them laughing. I like to hear that, man, they they just been blessed tremendously down at their house. Amen? I don't ever want to rejoice in somebody's misery uh, like some folks do. He says to be happy or to be well off. Look, some of y'all are doing so good, I wish it was me. Amen. I mean, I like to have rich friends. I'm not rich, but I'd like to have my friends' money sometimes. Call it covenants. I'm happy for him, but I wish it was me. Amen. And it ought to do good when their kids are doing good. I mean, he's up here bragging about her dropping 39. I could probably dunk on her today. I'm just going to say. Amen. But look here, I'm glad she could drop 39. I'm glad that uh, Christian is doing good. I'm glad Jordan is doing well. It does me good. And I hope mine does good. Look here, I want them to have a great life. All these kids in here, some of them I've watched grow up, and I want them to do well. Amen. 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 And you ought to be the same way, but he said examine yourself. Look at yourself and ask yourself what I need. It's a very simple message today, and I, I, I tried to really get out of preaching this sermon, but, but I can't do it. He said uh, we need to examine ourselves, and I thought we need to examine our appetites. What do we feast on? You know, I mean, everybody in this room likes to eat. The older I get, the more I like to eat. I used to weigh 165 pounds. I used to. I weigh 185 to 90 pounds. Yeah, it's twisted steel, but it's still there. (laughs) Amen. Got it. Amen. (laughs) Look here. But I like to eat. You, all of us, like to eat. We're going to go eat here after a while. But, you know, spiritually, we sit down to a table, and what are we feasting on? When I look at the church, when I listen to people, sometimes I talk about what they love and what they like. I'm thinking, man, your appetite just don't describe what you say. Amen. He said in uh, Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, there is an eternal righteousness we get when we get saved. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When I got saved, the Spirit of God moved inside me. I'm sealed to the day of redemption. And when he looks at me and says, You're sinless and you're holy and you're sanctified and you're ready to go to heaven, that is that eternal sanctification that God Almighty put inside me. But the one he's talking talking about here in Matthew chapter 5 is that daily progressive sanctification of just the hungry and thirsting after righteousness only you know yourself in your own heart when you roll out of the bed and your feet hit the floor does it really matter to you that God is pleased with the way that you walk the words that you use hey they're your associates and everybody else everywhere you go hey whatever you're feasting on hey God's word will just say look you can be full of God if you want to. I like God on me as much as in me. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I know that personally in my own life. I've tried walking with the world and loving God at the same time. You go to the average jail, they've got lines all over the sidewalks. And those men, every once in a while, they'll say, hey, get back in line. Get inside the lines. You know what it is? He's walking on that line. I mean, there'd be no issue. All he's got to do is stay inside the line. But what we do is we get over there on the line, and we just start walking. We see how close we can get to it, and sometimes we'll get over it. And somebody on the inside called the Holy Ghost, hey, some Holy Ghost-filled preacher on the outside, hey, the Holy Brethren, 
turned out the church. They call us back. They rein us back in. But they some people, friend, they get up every single day. They'll tell you I love God, but everything about their life, it totally denies what they're saying. He said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, can I tell you, hunger and thirst is the most basic need you're ever going to have in your life. Before you go to bed at night, you got to get something to eat, something to drink. You get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? You go get something to drink, and you start piffing around for something to eat. You know why? Because you need both of them. And look here, as Christians, there's things we'll be naturally drawn to. Now, like I said, I remember when those two were not even here. Remember him, he was standing up in the front seat of the car when they came over to that wild one in, picked me up to go eat with them for the first time. Never forget it. Now, he's drunk a whole lot of milk. <laughs> he's drunk a lot of milk and he's ate the cow. He's a big, strong man. They've done the same. When you have a baby, if you've got an infant in here, I know that when they come into this world, there's two things they're going to be naturally drawn to. You don't have to tell them to be drawn to it. It's just there. They're going to be drawn to their mother's breast or to a bottle. You know why? Because that's where they know uh, instantly, I mean just out of uh, uh, nature, they know that's where they're supposed to get their sustenance. And as a child of God, when you get saved, you ought to have an appetite for the Word of God. There's some people, the only time they ever read their Bible, look at the Bible, listen to the Bible, friend, is when they come to Sunday school, they come to the preaching service. I mean, it's been forever since they've sat down in their own living room, turned off the TV, tuned out the world, opened up that Bible and said what David said in Psalm 119 and 18, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wonderful things out of thy law, them high things, them holy things, them hidden things, uh, all those helpful things, God just show them to me. Look here, there's nothing like sitting down at your table or in your own bedroom or in your living room somewhere somewhere and you talk about the word of God to your family you read it yourself hey I may already know it he may already know it but if you go and the spirit of God speaks to you you know what happens friend there's something fresh dumped in your soul it excites you like nothing else you know what that is that's God speaking to you 1 Peter 2 to his newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Right. Bible don't mean a whole lot to some people. Sure. So how do you know I see it laying up in the back window of the car? Right. Right. Amen. Right. I mean, uh, uh, they'll leave you to church and my, you might have two or three. But I'm telling you, when I got saved, I was a very poor reader. But you know what? I'd look here. I had to take British novels. I hate every British novel that's ever been wrote. First one they dropped on my desk was David Copperfield. That book's that thick. I had to read all them books to get out of the school. High school. So how'd you do it? I cheated. <laughs> Amen. I made a D, that meant done. <laughs> I'd read a little bit and I'd listen to the discussions and I'd pass all the little quizzes but I bloated on the big test. But I got a 71, got gone. I, never, I, did, I look, I can't even read a whole uh, article in the newspaper back then. But you know, after I got saved, I'd sit down and read a chapter of the Bible. Sure. And I'll tell you right now, if you read a chapter a day of the New Testament, you'll do what something that no, most Christians never do in their Christian life. If you read one chapter a day in way less than a year, you'll read your New Testament all the way through and have a bunch of time left over. But look, after I got saved, I started hearing, hey, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And then one day I made up my mind, I'm just going to read the Bible, and whatever God tells me, I'm going to do that. Whatever He tells me to quit doing, I'm going to do that. But I fell in love with the Bible. Thank God Almighty, the Lord gave me a book. That friend, I'm telling you, has stood the test of time uh, down through the ages. Every saint of God that's ever been through any kind of misery, they've always had their Bible. Amen. 
You know, there's going to be a day you're going to need your Bible more than you need the next breath you're going to take. Job, in the midst of his misery, in chapter 23, in verse number 8, said, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as go. He knew the end result before I ever got thrown in the fire. You go back in verse uh, one, chapter 1, verse 8. He, God said, have you ever considered this man? He said, my foot hath held his steps. It's in the midst of his misery, losing his wealth and his family, everything. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said the only thing that got me through my misery was the word of God. He said when I looked on my right and my left, he said I couldn't see God. He said I couldn't feel God. He said but it's the word of God, the commandments of his lips that kept me right on path. He said in verse 14 for he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. There's some God appointed troubles that's going to come your way. Uh, those are things that Job 14 1 talked about. A man being born a few days and full of trouble. There's some God ordained trouble headed your way. God's going to throw you in the fire, but you will find Him in the furnace when you can't see Him around you. You don't know where God's at. He knows exactly where you are. When you don't know what God's going to do, you've got to know what you're going to do. There's going to be days like that. Amen. You know, sometimes those troubles, in verse 16, He said, For God maketh my heart soft. Sometimes your trouble, they soften you up. Yeah. Amen. But look here. This book's been baptized in the blood of countless martyrs. True. Look, I don't understand a man in a seminary when he talks about the old King Jimmy. I don't even think a guy like that's saved. A man that would tell you, I mean, they know Hebrew and Greek better than they know English. You know, I've got to the place where the, the Hebrew and Greek you to death. I said, how many Hebrews and Greeks you see in here? I said, they need somebody that's a rare back and preach to them in English. And when they get done, they ain't got no idea what he had to say when he went out the door. They, some of them, they've mastered the art of preaching for a, a year after year without saying anything, offending anybody. But every once in a while, uh, people coming to church need to feel bad. Uh, they need some preaching that will put them under conviction. Friend, I'm telling you, that preaching will overjoy your soul and make you shout the praises of God. God. But I'll guarantee you this book right here, it stood the fires of so many martyrs. Hey, look here, friend, the, 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 the persecution of so many governments. Hey, most of the world now is banded from its borders, but it still to us stood the, uh, the test of time. They say it's a book of hate. I say it's a book of love. All it does is lay out what a man is and what a man needs to do to get right with God. Amen. But anyhow, now like I said, you can enjoy milk when you get grown, but you can't live on milk. Amen. Hebrews 5, 14, but strong meat. Belongs to them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use, having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know why some people say, I can't believe that preacher said that. He sees what you don't see. Because he's used it. He's turned the pages. He's read it himself. He's looked at it. There's people in the church. He's all oh, that family over there, they ain't nothing but a bunch of old fogies. That's all they are. And they need to let their kids do this, this, and this. You know why that family knows? They got a mom and daddy that turns them pages. And they read it in order in their heart. And they say, I know what's best for you. Amen. Look here, by reason, you know how to discern what's good and what's evil. We got preachers now wanting to condemn homosexuality. Can I tell you, sodomy is still a sin? 
Amen. I know we're insane. We believe, look, I come out of a divorced home. But I believe the reason it's so uh, rampant in our churches now, preachers quit preaching on it. When you all get married, you're supposed to get old together. Amen. I've been married to the same one 36 years. Look, there's a lot of days she wanted to throw me out a window, but she's prayed and got through it and put up with me. Amen. There's days when I wanted to pack it in and walk off down the road. Uh, hey, but I loved her too much. I love my son too much. I love God too much. I love my home too much. Hey, I believe what this Bible said that God made the man the head of the household that woman is a heart them children are the heritage of the home and when you run your life according to this book yeah. it's going to be so much better sure. now I know I'm preaching like your pastor and I'm not your pastor and I don't want to overstep my bounds brother Doug if I do you just ring a bell tell me shut up the word of God ought to mean something to us sure. yeah. Amen. it meant enough for some people to watch your children die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, when they would take up those huge offerings in the Bible, you know, all them saints would pile it all in one pile and distribute among each other. You know what? It wasn't to pay the deadbeat's light bills. No. No. It wasn't to feed sinners. It was to take care of those women and children that their husbands was in jail. He was to take care of those orphan children. Because Saul, before he was Paul, he would haul them men and women off to jail. You know why they done it? For the Word of God's sake. There was people back in Paul's day that corrupted the Word of God. Amen. Even then. They said, well, we're going to write it to where everybody can understand it. I think y'all are understanding what I'm saying because some of his face is telling it. Can I tell you, you can make the Bible as simple as you want to. Some people's never going to get it. You know why? Because they ain't supposed to. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man. Receive not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he receive them for their spirits are discerned. You've got to have the Holy Ghost in you to believe that thing. But anyway, about worship. Now, I like worship. But you know, I mean... I know we carry it too far sometimes. You know, people says, y'all just, you know, that preacher screams and yells. I wish I could scream and yell like I used to. I mean, from start to finish, it used to be hammered down till I got done. I ain't got that much wind anymore. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I like that kind of preaching. Amen. But look here about worship when you come in here. Can I tell you, I've been in churches so quiet you can hear the lights pop and crack. I ain't going there. I'm saying, look, I've been in churches where they throw song books. But cannonball in the baptistry. I ain't going to do that. But I will tell you what I'm going to do. Psalm 100 and verse 4 said, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Got a lot to be thankful for today. Now look here, friend, if you've got a, a home where there's some happiness, and even if it is a second marriage, you ought to do the best you can with that thing and make it a good place. Amen? If your kids, look, they may not be the, 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 the best kids in town, but if they're not in jail or strung out on dope, you've got something to be thankful for. Amen? Look here, friend, thank God Almighty if you've got a job and your needs are being met and you can buy things for your family and you can provide a good living for we got a lot to thank God for. If you got your health, son. Look here, Miss Jane just got out of the hospital. There's some folks laying up there in that hospital. They would love to enter in his course today with Thanksgiving. Amen. Look here, he said, end his course with praise. He said, Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That's what we're doing when we come through them doors. So I ain't got nothing to be thankful for. Mercy. I'm broke. I'm sick. My kids are in jail. Amen. You know what you got to do? You got to do like Job done. Yeah. He said in verse 5, For the Lord is good. Yeah, right. If you ain't got nothing else to praise God for, if you see how awful I am, or how awful he is, or she is, look here, quit looking at us, look at him, and say, thank God he is good. God is still good. He was good in eternity past. He's good now. He'll be good in eternity future. And if you've got nothing to praise him for, say he's good, and his mercy endure forever. Amen. You know why some of you ain't in hell today? 
God's mercy. Yeah. I've had men cuss God to my face, call Him everything but God and Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, why don't you strike Him down? Amen. Even Christopher Hutchins, when he was hit, uh, Hitchens, when he was dying, there was Christians sent him a note and said, we're praying for you. He kind of chuckled and said, I appreciate it. Don't believe it, he said, but I appreciate it. His tune had changed. Yeah. Amen. Now he's in eternity, and he knows better now. Sure. Sure. Look here. His mercy. He's kind to the unthankful and to the evil. God sees all the evil and all the good and His mercy, His kindness, His goodness will not allow them to go off into eternity. I've stood by their bed and I've watched them scream as they left this world. Friend, I know where they went. I've stood by the bedside of people I've loved. The last time I think my mother I ever heard her saying she had her hand in the air begging God to let her die. Just me and her in that room. Can I I tell you, friend, eternity is a real thing. I comfort my heart and Lord. I've shouted with my mother in church. I'm going to shout with her in heaven one day. Thank God Almighty for the mercy of God. He didn't let me die in my sin and go to hell. But anyhow, you got to examine your attitude. Can I tell you just the appetite but your attitude? Everybody's got an attitude. It's either good or bad or indifferent. Everybody's got an attitude. Met an emo one time. Does anybody here know what an emo is? I didn't. There was this girl. I preached at the church. And she sat on the front row. And I said, what's wrong with her? Preacher said, she's an emo. What's an emo? Somebody with no emotions. I said, oh, contrary. Everybody's got emotions. Boredom is an emotion. I said, you want to know if she got emotion or not? I go over there, stomp on her toe. Trust me, she's got emotion. <laughs> Bend her finger back till it touches her wrist. She is not an emo. Everybody's got emotions. Yeah, right. You got to add to a good one or a bad one. Right. I've had both. Amen. Look here. Winston Churchill said an attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Sure. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Maybe if you change your attitude, the world changes for you. Yeah. Some people, the world stinks. I'm thinking, hey man, get that Limburger cheese from out and run your nose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. Everybody's awful. Everything's awful. I mean, nothing good. You want to get away? My son, this past week, he got some friends. And he said, every time I get around that guy, Dad, he said, I'm depressed. He said, I'm depressed now. He said, I've been hanging out. I said, you need to get a new friend. Yeah, right. Pun him to the curb. Yeah. Amen. You don't date hateful girls. He said, I went out with her and said, she's hateful. I said, I'll get worse when you marry him. <laughs> yeah. She's hateful now. It's going to get worse, G. I said, don't be dragging nothing in her like that. But anyway. The attitude about the building. What do you think about church? Some of you want to leave already. And it's only 12 o'clock. I've had people tell me, if I know you was preaching, I'd have left. I said, service ain't started yet. Pack it up. Amen. That's right. I love going to church. I got saved on Sunday morning, and I got so saved, they didn't even have to invite me back Sunday night. I got so full of the Holy Ghost, I even showed up on Wednesday. Amen. Yeah. I love revival. I go to church in prison. I be preaching in prison tomorrow night in the, in the, in the church in the chow hall is what we call it. Amen. Got my church in the chow hall. But I'm telling you, when I got saved, I couldn't hardly wait to get back. I mean, them folks were so excited. I was excited. I just love being in the building. Right. Amen. 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 Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I love the church. I want to give myself to the church. The day I got saved, I couldn't give them nothing. 
day I got saved, I was a long-haired redneck. I'm a no-haired redneck now. But look here. I got saved on Sunday morning and I was so excited. Look, they sung Amazing Grace like Grace was still amazing. Made me want to be there. Amen. Look here. I couldn't do nothing for that truck. I couldn't give them nothing. They had to give me something. You got a church that gives something and look, trust me, you give what you're supposed to give and you will get out of people like me. Look, they didn't know there was a preacher that just walked through the door. He was nothing but just a little thief that just got out of trouble, almost went to prison and sat there two weeks later, got saved in their church, said some of the dumbest and the wildest things. They would sit there and they'd say, Larry, we used to laugh at you all the time. You'd cry about the, the the littlest things and we'd act like we're serious and then we'd get in the car and laugh that's all the way home yeah they said that boy was going to make it some theory. he'll never make it I just hung around church I went to church when I was cold I went when I was hot I went when I was lukewarm when I was up when I was down when I was in when I was out always hung around the church because I always got what I needed but anyhow Acts 20 28 you know what he tells him Take heed to yourself. He got some high standards, First Timothy 3. Yeah. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost made you overseer. Yeah. He's your shepherd, kind of. Yeah. He said to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. The blood of Emmanuel, God Himself, it paid the price for you and I to sit in this building and worship His wonderful name. Amen. Hard to mean something about church. Amen. 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 David said in Psalm 26, 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thy honor dwells. We come here to honor Him, sure. not me. David. It's not about me or Him, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, but anyhow. I heard Adrian Rogers say this one time. He said, people go to church three times in life. He said, when they're born, when they get married, and when they die. He said, first time, throw a little water on them. Second time, throw rice at them. Third time, throw dirt on them. Can I tell you, the church is worth a whole lot more than that. I couldn't imagine a world without a church. Amen. I'm telling you, son, if God done at everybody's house what he done at our house. My mother was five foot four. She was a stick of dynamite, son. She had 12 kids. I've seen the car crammed full of kids. Let's go down the road. And she had to make a stop. She got out. Wear this woman out good. I'm talking about wallet that girl. Good, son. Beat the stuffing out of her. Get in the car and let's go down the road. Yeah. I've seen the daddy kick the door off the hinges. Cussing and fussing, drinking and eating them old black RJSs. And I've seen them cuss and fight with each other. I'm told about a UFC pay-per-view event, son. I'm not told about them little arguments we all get in. I'm told about duking it out. I've seen God Almighty come in that house where all that stress and that strain and all that trouble was. I've seen him say both of them. I've seen him son, talk about God together, pray together, go to church together. Their kids worship up with them. Thank God Almighty I'm so glad that God Almighty had a church full of people that love sinners. Amen. Oh yeah, that's right. But anyhow. Yeah. About this building, I love coming there. People like these folks here and these folks here, they've sat there for a hundred years. Amen. Amen, your families. So many families in here that I've just learned to love and just fell in love with. Bob gave me a picture one time. I still got them a study. I mean, your kids give me drawings. I keep some of them. I can't keep up with all that stuff. But I appreciate it. Amen. But anyhow, about the body. It's the building. I love coming down here meeting with you. But I, the body. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. 
when you have love one for another. You know how you, how you treat your family tells them how you feel about your family. Right. You know in jail, sometimes they got pictures of the kids on, just can't wait to get home to my babies. I'm talking about the women do that too. Just can't wait to get home to my babies. They get out and three months later they're back. What happened to your babies? You hit that corner again, didn't you? Hit that bar again, didn't you? Same old buddies again, didn't you? Why don't you stay home with your husband and your wife and your kids? Oh, that's way too boring. Most of the nights your house like mine, pretty boring. How about the most boring fellow you're going to meet in your life? People get married and think, I don't know what to expect. Hallmark movies. I, I, I don't watch them. <laughs> them things ought to be rated triple G. There's not even a garbage can in the scene. <laughs> that ain't the way it is. I see your husband. He don't look nothing like that man. She don't act nothing like that woman. Amen. They shoot the neighbor's dogs. <laughs> yeah, I know things. Amen. Amen. Sometimes they ain't got all their teeth. Sometimes they ain't got all their hair and they're not big and handsome. But I love hanging around. Amen. You go over there, what are we going to do now? I ain't doing nothing. I'm sitting right here. When my son was little or a teenager, he'd tell you now. He goes, Daddy, I'm bored. I said, I don't care. I'm not. Leave me alone. I'm okay. Now he says, I'm going to go over here. Hey, Seth, I'm going to sit right here. But anyway, we have love one for another. Now, when I say I love Brother Doug and his family, I love that family. There's families all over this country. I love them. There, there's a friend of mine, Annalise uh, Ladadio. She was, I think, Annalise was 17. Watched that girl grow up. She's one of the sweetest girls you ever want to meet. She had a little prayer garden at the end of her driveway. You know, she'd go out there and pray uh, every night. A friend of hers, she'd done it in honor of her friend. She got up one night and she turned around. She took two steps and fell over dead. I just cried like it was my own little girl. Brother Paulo and his family, it just, I mean, you're talking about God had to do something there. Can I, tell, I love people. When they hurt, I hurt too. I just called him. I said, Paulo. And we both just started bawling. If I, if I found out something happened to any of his kids, as close as I've been to that crew, it would be the same thing. Look here. Old Pete back here. I like Pete. Pete, you know, he's here. Amen. That family, Brian, forget your name, but I kind of like his family too. Some of y'all's faces. Amen. His, I mean, just all these, I, I just, I love y'all. I, when I say I love the church, I love God's people. I love hanging around with them. You know, I got married. I found my wife in the church. Well, you just don't know them girls like I do, and they probably don't know you either. Amen. I was preaching my wife. Two of her friends got saved. She said, I believe he would be a nice guy. No doubt about it. Amen. She told me a couple times. I, she said, look, I'm leaving. I said, look, woman, I'll throw you out a door. You'll be jumped through a window. You ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The family. The family. Or oh, love each other. Romans 12, 10 said, Be kindly affectioned one to another. You ought to be kind to each other. We cut up and carry on, but in the end, we're truly kind to each other. I mean, when my wife fell, got all these cards, letters, calls, emails, texts. I mean, you know what that's doing? That's been kindly affectionate of one to another. It's preferring one another. Look, you go to some of these uh, camp meetings and these preachers, if there's a few hundred there, every one of them knows, I'll be on the shy of a doubt that God is going to call His number. I've been in those same meetings where there's seven or eight of them, and they're begging the other one to preach. God prefer one before another. But anyway, Galatians 5.13 says, Serve one another. It ain't all about you waiting, getting waited on. Sometimes it's you waiting on somebody else. Right. Ephesians 4, 2, some of you are doing this right now. He said, forbear one another. Yeah. 
God gives me a headache. I preached at my home church. I preached on heaven. This woman said, I'm telling you, that was good, but you're so loud and you're so long. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's what I said too. Hebrews 10, 24, consider one another. You ever see somebody mess up? I've seen so many people mess up over the years. I've seen them just fail and their families fall apart. It breaks my heart. Sometimes I, I see them and I hug their neck and I tell them how much I miss them. I love it when somebody that's out of church, they see you at the store and they act like they don't see you. That ever happened to you? Because you ain't been to church. I always run them down. I said, hey, come here. I make a big scene. I said, don't act like you don't know who I am. I said, I'm your brother and I love you and I miss you. And I want you back over there. When I see their family destroyed in so many ways, I think, man, that could be me. Sure. When I see a preacher run off with a woman or a bunch of money or, or whatever, I consider myself, because it would be me, Galatians 6, 1, but 1 Peter 3, have compassion one of another. Be pitiful, be courteous. You ought to have some compassion. Makes a difference. Amen. Being pitiful and being courteous to other people. Look here. There's a the whole message. I'm just rushing through this thing. Let me finish right here. Got to examine your associates. Who you know, where you go. Tells me everything I need to know about you. Amen. I said, you girls ever get a boyfriend that drags you to the back? Well, actually, in psychology, that would be the front, but. Yeah, I took psychology. I can't help. That's the front of the building. Actually, I'm in the back of it. So, a little weird. <laughs> but they drag you to the front of the building. And he acts like he's bored to death. Punt him to the curb. Amen. Right. Amen. Muscle's going to turn into puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like his daddy in time. Trust me. She ain't always going to look like a movie star. If you look here, she does, more power to you. But look here. Your friends, friend loved at all times. Proverbs 17, 17. Preach friend of ours that we know very well. He had messed up. Hadn't seen him in years. And when I saw him, I put my car in park and I jumped out and I hugged him and said, Boy, I sure do miss you, Wayne. We just talked, and my son, he listened to us talk back and forth. And he said, you know, he said, just like you all just picked up right where you left off. You know what that friend of mine said? He said, a friend, love up at all times. If you mess up, I'm still your friend. But if I have to, I'll come down to your house and knock on your door and let you know that I'm hey, still your friend. I want you to do well. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived, if communications corrupt good manners. Right. Hang around bad, you're going to be bad. Right. Say, so why is that? Because we're all prone to be bad. All of us, 8 to 80, got something tugging on our coattail. Right. Preachers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, song leaders, the best members in our church to the worst ones. Got something pulling on our coattail. Right. Amen. And what you need to do is stay away from bad things. You know what God's not going to do? He's not going to remove you from your situation. I don't know why things keep happening. Well, maybe if you get some new friends and go some new places. Kind of like one fellow said, said, y'all pray for me. God take these cigarettes away from me. One fellow told him, said, look, God don't smoke. He don't want them. <laughs> Amen. You got to get rid of them cigarettes yourself. Make not provision to the, for the flesh to fulfill the lust there. If you like to drink, quit hiding a just-in-case bottle in your fridge because you're going to drink it. If you're trying to quit something, if you like them dirty books, look here, just-in-case is right around the corner. You'll have it before you know it. You need to get rid of all them things, abstain from all appearance of evil, and just march on with people that's going to make you better. Amen. Amen. I never have had a hard time finding somebody more spiritual than me. But anyway, your fellowship. Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life that deals with geographical boundaries. 
Can I tell you something? Young, young people. I went and seen this guy. This family is a county official in my hometown. Two sons strung out on dope. Somebody told him about me, and look, I, I told him, look, but I never was a drug addict. I said, I used to sniff gas. Don't do that. <laughs> Seen chickens the last time I've done it. I thought, I got to quit this. I told him, I didn't smoke much marijuana. Just two or three acres of it. That's all. <laughs> don't do that either. I don't like to talk about all that stuff, really. But you know, I pulled up, and this guy said, well, I thought somebody looked like a hell's angel was going to pull up here. And he got a little bald-headed old man. I said, you know, old criminals, they used to be young criminals. Old fools used to be young fools. I didn't think I'd get this old this fast. But here I am. You will too. And you know what I found out? Every one of us has something that we want to do that is not good. So, hey man, whatever it is, you know what we call addiction. The Bible calls it lust. Lust is an uncontrollable desire for something that you know that is bad for you, that you shouldn't have, but you want it more than anything. And sometime or another, you are just going to have to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to be with them. No, I'm not going to do what I want to do. Amen. We're all tempted to sin. Somebody says, I don't know why I do these drugs. God, Jeb will not tell him. Me and him loaded trucks all day together. Work together. He gets thrown in jail every once in a while. He said, Larry, you know me. He said, uh, we load trucks over there. He said, I drink that hot liquor all day. He carried liquor in his, in his boot and he drank it all day. I was preaching. He was drinking all day. He said, I come down here to jail for months. Don't drink nothing. He said, every once in a while we'll make that old julep. That's jailhouse liquor. And he said, I don't like it. He said, I don't even drink it. He said, but the first thing I do when I hit them steps is walk right over to that liquor store and get me something to drink. He said, why do I do that? I said, that's easy, bro. You love it. I think it's John 3, 18. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. We all do what we love. Amen. There's things that everybody in this building, no matter who you are, friend, I'm telling you, no matter where you're from, every once in a while, you've got an opportunity to do wickedness and you say no because you know in the long run it's going to destroy your testimony. It's going to get you in trouble and you walk on in spite of it. Amen. Amen. You got to say no. Right. Right. My son got a ticket the other day. 88 miles an hour. <laughs> Scooting. I told him, I said, you keep running late for school. I always told him, when they pull you over, just stick your license out the window and the insurance. Don't say nothing. That's what he done. He said, the guy was pretty nice about it. He wasn't driving your car. He wasn't pressing your gas. It was you. I was telling you, get out of here, get to school, and you drug around. It's your fault. It wasn't the cop's fault. You could have got everybody. Yeah, I could have got everybody else, but just so happened I got you. Amen? But anyway, let me finish here. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 6, and I'm going to quit. Wow, it's 1230. I have preached way too long. I, that's 50 minutes. I started preaching about 20 till. Is that right? Huh? 56? Oh, God. I'm sorry, Doug. Y'all look like you're pretty interested. Okay. Okay. Be not only yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What corner hath Christ with Belial? What part of he that believed with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be a shepherd, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you. You know what he's telling you? Religiously, you need to be separate. What agreement? That temple of God with idols. Why in the world would you be a Baptist and marry a Catholic? You just ask for trouble. Amen. Don't matter to us it will when it comes to get your children right with God. Amen. Said, you know, talking about your associates out there. You know, this you seen this tag coexist, we're already doing that. We're already doing that. They want us to come together and just we can't do that. But look here. Said believers with unbelievers. I ain't got no friends that are unbelievers in what I believe. I go in that prison, I walk up that sidewalk, the sodomites in that prison will tell you, that preacher's always friendly to me. He's always nice to me. I'm friendly to them, but I'm not their friend. Right. Amen. Amen. Sure. I can be sociable without hanging around with you. Right. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for this church, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, brother. message is clear. You need to examine yourself. Where do you stand with God? That's the only thing that really matters. Where do you stand with Him? The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You can think long enough and hard enough and try and convince yourself enough, but the truth of the matter is, God knows. Are you right with God? you're here today and you're not saved, you ought to get saved. You ought to come, repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's why He came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. He came to bleed and die to give you eternal life because you'd die and go to hell without Him. If you're here today and you're saved, are you really the Christian you ought to be? How's your attitude? How's your walk? How's your associates? How much do you care about the church and the things of God? I say this all the time. A hundred years from now, the only thing that's going to matter is what we did for Jesus. How's your walk? Examine yourself. We're going to have a song of invitation. If you need to do business with God, the altar's open. If you're not saved, once you come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible, show you how to be saved. If you're not sure if you're saved, you ought to come and get that nailed down. If you're saved, what kind of Christian are you? What does the world see? Do they see Christ? Or do they see mm, the definition of hypocrisy? God help us in this day and age to live as Christ. Turn to what page, Brother Ray? 177. Page 177. Folks are praying. You mind the Lord. Will you come? Mind the Lord. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.